I'm going to read fast. Hang on to your seats. Then Joshua summoned all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, including the elders, leaders, judges, and officers. So they came and presented themselves to God. And Joshua said to the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Noah, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. What did they do? But I took your ancestor Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him to the land of Canaan. And I gave him many descendants through his son Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave the mountains of Seir, while Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. That produced Joseph. And then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I brought terrible plagues on Egypt. And afterwards I brought you out as free people. But when your ancestors arrived at the Red Sea, the, the... Egyptians chased you after you with chariots and charioteers. And when your ancestors cried out to the Lord, I put darkness between you and the Egyptians. I brought the sea crashing down on the Egyptians, drowning them. And with your very own eyes, you saw what I did. Then you lived in the wilderness for many years, and finally I brought you into the land of the Amorites on the east side of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I destroyed them before you. I gave you victory over them, and you took possession of their land. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, started a war against Israel. He summoned Balaam, the son of Baor, to curse you, but I would not listen to him. Instead, I made Balaam bless you, and so I rescued you from Balak. When you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho, the men of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, the Perserites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gerashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I gave you victory over them. I sent Terah ahead of you to drive you out of the two kings of the Amorites. It was not your swords or bows that brought you victory. I gave you victory. Uh, Say, I gave you land you had not worked for. I gave you towns you did not build. The towns where you are now living. I gave you vineyards and olive groves for food, though you did not plant them. Verse 14. So, fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. He just gave us a whole history lesson. Of the faithfulness of God. Of how God has been with his people. Fighting for his people. Giving victory over enemies for his people. Over the decades and over the generations. And he laid it all out before him. And he sums it all up with this. Since I told you all that and reminded you. Fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols of your ancestors worship when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Put away the idols. Get rid of the idols. All these things they used to worship. All these things they used to serve. What used to be important. What used to be prominent. What, used, what they used to pay attention. You got to quit all this mess. Pay attention. Fear the Lord and worship Him. Serve the Lord alone, it says. Does it say serve the Lord with some things on the side? Does it say serve the Lord with some exceptions? No. No, it doesn't. The, I didn't say I do with exceptions to Starla. I didn't say I do with a chick on the side. I didn't say these things. I said I do in sickness and health. Right? Rich or poor. In every scenario, I'm committed to you. He says, serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you now live? But as for me and my family... We will serve the Lord. And so he gives an option. If you want to go back to the gods of your ancestors, of the, of the Euphrates, then go. This is your time to bail. Like, leave. If, if you want to worship the gods of the lands that you now live, then get out of here. 
But you have to understand, you don't get to dip a foot in both waters. Choose ye this day whom you serve. You've got to make up your mind. But then the people replied, We would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God is one who rescued us. And the Lord our God is the one who rescued us and our ancestors from slavery in the land of Egypt. He performed mighty miracles before our very eyes. And as we traveled through the wilderness among our enemies, he preserved us. It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites and the other nations living here in the land. So we too will serve the Lord for he alone is our God. Say, he alone alone. is our God. God. And then Joshua warned the people. All right, I've heard you, he says. You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy and jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you abandon the Lord and serve other gods, he will turn against you and destroy you even though he's been good to you. Hold on. Did we just hear that? He's talking to God's people. And God's people just said, oh no, he alone is our God. And Joshua says, I hear what you're saying, but I need you to understand what you're saying. I need you to get this wrapped up inside of you, okay? Because what he's telling you, if you abandon him and serve other gods, he's going to turn against you, even though he has been so good to you. Do you believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? So the same God that would abandon his people back then is the same God who would abandon his people here today? Now, come on now. Right? Right? We have to understand certain implications of who God is. God doesn't want to turn from you. He doesn't want to abandon you. But he says, serve me alone. Even though he's been so good to me, even though the Lord has financially blessed me, even though the Lord has been good and given me children and prosperity and a family, man, it just seems like he's pouring everything on. Are you telling me that God's so good? Are you telling me he'll walk away? If you will. <laughs> it's rough preaching, Parker. It's rough preaching. All right, then, Joshua said, destroy the idols among you. Turn your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. Then the people said to Joshua, we will serve our Lord, and we will obey him alone. Did we get it? Did we get it? I hope we do. I got 15 minutes to help you get it. Possibly three hours. I'm going to tell you what got me on this. I walked up to a house this week. And I walked up to the house on the front door. God blesses this hole. Real big on the front door. Walked inside the house, scripture, different things posted all around. And then I turn and I read the scripture, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's what it said. I read it. God blesses his house. God's faithful. God, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then I walked out in the front yard. And I saw a witch and a ghost and something that looked really strange. (laughs) Let me make a statement that could possibly make you mad, but I don't care much. I don't understand what business any Christian has to do with celebrating Halloween. I don't. I need need it to be said. Did Did you hear the scripture that I just read? He was dealing with a people who was erecting idols in their homes and in their yards and in their lives and in their families. And the Lord God said that, I'm going to give you a chance, but you're going to have to choose whom you serve. You got to figure it out. You got to choose who you serve. Okay, God, we choose you. Good. Then go and destroy all the idols. Go and destroy everything. Now, don't you run around your neighborhood popping all your friends' blow-ups. 
that gets you in trouble. You get thrown straight in jail. All right? But, but I, there has to come a time by which we decide, consecrate, determine within ourselves who we're for. You're either for me or against me, says the Lord. There, there has to, you guys, I ain't mad at all this. The world's going to do what the world does. But the church is supposed to be set apart. There's supposed to be a difference. <sighs> he didn't say serve me with something on the side. Nope. And you say, oh, it's the harm, pastor. It's not a big deal. My kids just want to go get candy. I hear you. I hear you. I've made this same argument with you. I hear you. I was a kid who really wanted to go trick-or-treating. I get it. But at what cost do we really, are we really capable of seeing the reality of the cost of allowing our children and ourselves to dabble just a little? Right? It is. Think how stupid this sounds to unbelievers. <laughs> hey, the Lord God is my God, and I serve him, and I follow him my whole life. I give him everything, except on Halloween. I put witches and goblins in my front yard. Does it, sound, does, it doesn't make sense. Like there has to be a consistency in God's people. <laughs> I know not everybody preaches it. I just don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't, I, I, don't, I, don't, I get it. What I do get is consecration. I get the purpose of consecration. You guys ready? Do you guys know D.L. Moody? Yes. Yes. D.L. Moody made this statement. He said, the world has yet to see what God will do with and for and through and in and by a man who's fully and wholly consecrated to him. The world has yet to see what God will do with and for and through and in and by the man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. D.L. Moody. This, when the Lord spoke this to him, he said it changed his whole life. It changed his whole outlook. And from that point on, he made a decision that his, his life must resemble consecration. It must resemble what it looks like to be sold out. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. You are only one decision away from a totally different life. Amen. This was it for him. One decision away. When these words hit his eardrum, they didn't register as a good idea. They cut straight to his soul. And they called consecration as his life's pursuit. This is what I'm running after. And you are only one decision away from everything changing inside of your life. The problem is that it will probably be the toughest decision you'll ever make. It's probably going to be the hardest thing you'll ever do. And continue to be the hardest thing. But if you have the courage to surrender completely yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, there is no telling what God will do. Do we get it? D.L. Moody would lead one of the largest spiritual awakenings across the whole entire world. 1800s. Still today, after he has passed away, we're still going to have the D.L. Moody Institute. We're going to have the D.L. Moody Publishing Houses. His, his legacy is still echoing all across the world because he decided, I'm going to live like the Bible teaches. I'm going to live that way. Anytime God is about to do something amazing in your life, he's going to call you to consecrate yourself. Anytime. That pattern is going to be established right before the Israelites crossed the Jordan and conquered into the promised land. So I, I, I just in the beginning read Joshua 24, and now I'm going to jump all the way back to the beginning. So at the end of Joshua's life, he makes this statement. And then at the very beginning of Joshua's uh, career as being the prophet for the land, he's going to look at us in Joshua 3.5 and says, Consecrate yourselves. 
For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Why do we need to consecrate ourselves? For the Lord will do amazing things amongst you. Here's our fundamental problem. We try to do God's job for Him. This is our fundamental problem. We want to do amazing things for God, and that seems noble and good. The problem is that we've got it backwards. God wants to do amazing things among us, for us. It's His job to do the amazing thing, not ours. This is how this is to work. Our job is to consecrate ourselves and live holy before the Lord. His job is to make it happen. This is how this is to work. And if we do our job, God will most certainly do his job. You can depend on that. And I think really before we begin to understand what consecration is, it's probably important that we also understand what it isn't. Consecration is not going to church every week. It is not keeping daily devotions. It is not fasting during Lent. It is not holding fast to the Ten Commandments. It's not sharing your faith with your friends. It's not giving God your tithe. It's not repeating the sinner's prayer. It's not volunteering for a ministry. It's not leading a small group. It's not raising your hands during worship. It's not going on a mission trip. Nope, I'm sorry. Consecration is not any of those things. Even though every single one of those things are good things that you can do and should do, what consecration is, is you have to understand it's more than behavior modification it's more than a conformity to a moral code it's more than doing good deeds it's something deeper it's something truer the word consecration means that you have to set yourself apart by definition consecration means demand full devotion It's dethroning yourself and enthroning Jesus Christ over your life. It's complete removal of all of your self-interest in allowing His will to determine your steps. It's the giving God veto power over your decisions. It's surrendering all of you to all of Him. All of you to Him. It's simple recognition that every second of every day, every ounce of energy, every penny, everything that I ever earn, everything that I'll ever do is a gift from God. All of it is. Consecration is an ever-deepening love for Jesus Christ. It's a childlike trust inside the Heavenly Father. A blind obedience to the Holy Spirit. What's so amazing about Abraham to me is that he went not knowing where he was going. It's that I'm following him. It's being completely sold out. Here's a great concern as a pastor is that people can go to church every single week of their lives and never be sold out to Jesus. It's a concern uh, that people can follow the rules but never follow Jesus. Uh, I'm afraid that we've cheapened the gospel by allowing people to buy in without selling out. We've made it far too convenient and comfortable to be saved. We've given people just enough Jesus to be bored, but not enough to feel a holy surge of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which drives and motivates and and ruins everything that you do for Jesus. Joshua 3, 5. Consecrate yourself, it says. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Amazing can never happen without consecration. I'm getting a lot of amens. The catalyst behind every spiritual growth spurt, every kingdom cause, every revival that's ever existed is consecrating your life to him. Everything. When you look back at your life, the greatest moments will be moments when you were committed. That will be the greatest moments of your life. 
The moment that you never gave up, that you never backed down, that you never bowed down, that you just, you stayed committed to whatever it is. Stayed committed. And it's true today as it was for Abraham when he placed Isaac on the altar. It was true the day that Jonathan climbed up the cliff to fight the the Philistines. It was true the day that Peter stepped out of the boat and walked towards Jesus. These memorable moments only came through complete devotion. Through following him no matter what. You know, I want you guys to get this, okay? And I really want us to understand this. There's a scripture, and I want, I want, I want to know how you feel about it. It's Psalms 115.3. All right, 115.3. And here's what it says. It says, our God is in the heavens, and he does as he wishes. <laughs> Woo! Right? God can do whatever he wants to do. Whenever he wants to do, however he wants to do it. God does whatever he wishes. Let me make this statement, all right? I want you to remember that God is not almost sovereign. God is either sovereign, reigning and ruling over everything, or he's not. That's it. He's not almost sovereign. Either he's in control or out of control. It's one of the two. And you have to come to a conclusion to who God is to you. In every believer, every follower, when we're going after him, we have to sometime make up our mind, either I'm all in or really I'm not and I think I am. It, it's, it's following him. You know what I love about the scripture that God can do whatever he wishes? Because God always knows what's best. You know what God's never going to do? God's never going to come to you, Starla, in the middle of the night and say, Psst, Starla, hey, Starla, um, do you think it'd be cool if I did this tomorrow? No, God's never going to do that because he already knows. Your steps were planned before you were ever born. He already knows what's best for you. He already knows what he has plans for you. God is going to do what God does, no matter how you feel about it. So when you're trying so hard and you're failing, we must remember God's in control. You you have to remember this. The devil is not a formidable opponent to God. Get that out of your mind, people. Wait, come on, somebody. The devil is simply a pawn on God's chessboard to be moved as he pleases to accomplish his purpose and his will. He is a created being. You have to understand this about who the devil is. You are not to fear him. Well, well, pastor, I just, you know, I just don't really understand why God is doing this or why God let this happen inside of my life. None of us have God figured out, man. If you have God figured out and you know everything that he's going to do and why he did it, then you're the fourth part of the Trinity. (laughs) Like, come on. And since you don't, then it means that you don't know the whole story. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go with the one who knows all things from beginning to end. And I'm going to put my trust and put my confidence and I'm going to blindly follow him at times because he's always proven to be for me, not against me. It's always proven this. 2 Corinthians 2, I mean 3, verse 3. It says, clearly you are a letter from Christ showing the results of our ministry among you. This letter is written not on pen or ink, but with the spirit of the living God. And it's carved not on tab- tablets of stone, but on what? Human hearts. But on human hearts, there's 66 books in the Bible, and your life is book 67. And as a follower of Christ, you are a living, breathing word of God. That's not written by pen and ink, but you are to be written by the Spirit of God who's alive within us, leading us to where we are to go. And that you can have these types of encounters with God also. Have you ever had an encounter with God? Come on, somebody. This is what I'm wondering. These encounters with God. Your faith is not formed out of someone else's experiences. Your faith, true faith, is birthed out of your own encounters with God. This is where your faith is going to come from. 
And you will stop doubting God when God does something so incredible inside you that even if you wanted to doubt him, you can't because the evidence is there. You just, you just can't. You can't move past it. You want to move past it, but you can't move past it. I can't forget this. I can't walk past this. I try to walk past this, and I try to go with reasoning, but this is still there. And I don't know how to wrap myself around it. David is going to cry out in Psalms 22, my God, my God. We have to remember that phrase because he was in a moment of distress, and even in his moment of distress, he did not call out, your God, your God. You know, when Starla gets real mad at the kids, she looks at me and says, Parker, you better go get your children. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, they're not hers. <laughs> I think too often we do that with God. When we don't understand, when we're in distress, when we're frustrated, he's your, your God. But David said, what you have to understand is in every circumstance, he's my God, my God. He, he, he's still there. He's not God in the bad times. Yep, he is. Is he God in the good times? Yep, he is. He's good all the time. He's God. This is who he is. God wants to take you from the place of their God to the place of my God. And he wants to move you there. And the path from their God to my God is found in complete devotion. It's found inside of this thing. If prayer is a conversation between man and God, then devotion's what you do after the prayer. Devotion is how you respond to the voice of the Lord. How do I, what do I do with it? True devotion to God will lead you to what you've been looking for your entire life. I can promise you this. If you don't believe me, just test me and see what the Lord says. I hear you, you don't believe me. Test me and see. For years, people have been saying to themselves, I know there's more to God than what I'm seeing. I've heard this, I've said this, I've encountered this. Because what they are seeing is not the complete gospel. It's only a partial gospel. They, they are reading things inside the Word of God that they're not necessarily seeing. When, when we hear of complete life change, but do you always see complete life change? You hear of people get healed, but are you seeing people be healed? You, and, and you wonder, there's this growing group of Christians that are not completely sold out. And the result of not being completely sold out is that I don't see what I read, so I'm only going to believe what I see. Instead of raising the standard of what I believe, not to what I see, but what I read. Nothing would have ever been created if Someone had to see it first before they built it. Amen. Nothing. Jesus says, you are blessed because you see me. But even more blessed is a man who does not see me but yet believes. Yeah. You guys remember the story of the rich young ruler? Mark 10, verse 17. I'm trying, guys. I'm trying to go through as fast as I can. Verse 21, it says, Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you like, go and sell all your possessions and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. But at these words, he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Here's the question that we ask, okay? Was Jesus actually asking this man to sell all that he had? If you were to read this scripture, and because Jesus told him to go and sell everything that you have, that you go and sell all that you have, then I'm going to suggest to you that you're no different than Simon the sorcerer who tried to buy the Holy Spirit. Is that not you just trying to purchase something? Selling all your possession in an attempt to get something that you want is no different than doing works to gain the approval of God. There's no difference. It just doesn't work that way. What Simon the sorcerer was after was the ability to lay hands on people so that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. This in itself, you have to understand, is not a bad thing. 
It's not a bad thing. But his motive for wanting it was wrong. To him it was a great display of power because he was a sorcerer seeking to add this to his bag of tricks. This is what he was going after. To which Peter's going to reply in Acts chapter 20. Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift from God with money. So God rejects money, stating that you can't buy the gift of God, but requires the rich young ruler to sell all that he has to follow God. What's God really after? (laughs) You know? Like, what's he really after? I believe it's the dethroning of yourself, of the things that you define yourself by, that God did not put on you himself. That's what I believe. I believe God wants you to break you down until you're totally His. All of it. Make no mistake, Jesus told the rich young ruler to sell all that he had. And I need you to understand, he had to sell all his stuff. It was required in that situation. God himself spoke to him and said, go and sell all that you have and come follow me. But what, you, you, what you've got to be careful is you can't just look at this man and try to theologically argue yourself, well, you know, God doesn't always, re- that's not really what God was saying in every situation. You have to understand. So I'm not really, <laughs> hear me. If God says it, you got to do it. That's it. Don't try to justify yourself out of doing what God has for you. you got to be careful. You have to be completely devoted to what God asks of you. Every bit of it, people. Every bit of it. I don't believe that God asks us to be celebrate. You know, like, I don't like it. Like, when I look at these different priests and these different people who have to be celebrate to be ministers, it doesn't make any sense to me. I'd hate to live that life. You know, but if God speaks to you and tells you to be celibate, you don't have an option. It it, it simply is what it is. Because what God blesses is not our actions, but our devotion towards Him. That's what the Lord blesses. Acts chapter 2, I'm going to end with this. Verse 42 Adam loves the scripture. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Did we get the scripture? When did the wonders and signs take place? When did it take place? They were continually devoting themselves. Everybody say, devoting myself to the apostles' teaching. Not just the teaching, but to the fellowship. And not just to the fellowship, but to the breaking of bread. And not just the breaking of bread, but to prayer. You can't skip one because you enjoy it more than the others. And When he did this, Joshua said, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things amongst you. It is my heart's desire that God does amazing things in your life, through your life, because of your life. I want you to be a living testimony of the power of Jesus Christ. What it looks like to be set free from the inside out. What it looks like to walk through the aisles of the supermarkets. Feel the pushing of the Holy Ghost. To hear Him speak. To obey what He speaks. And that people are saved in supermarkets and in schools and in job places. That people are healed on the sides of the street that people are healed in your neighborhoods through you because there's no reason why he shouldn't. Did you get what I just said? I believe we got to live in such a manner that there's no reason why God shouldn't 
Because most of us live in the manner by which, I don't know, I ain't really doing that right, so God's probably not going to use me. Joshua understood that if my people do not consecrate themselves, then there is no walking across the Jordan. When he comes on the scene, he says, consecrate yourself. For tomorrow, the Lord's going to do amazing things among us, Joshua 3. At the last chapter of Joshua, he's going to address his people, probably for the last time. And he's going to look at them and says, oh, here's what I need you to do. I'm about to roll out, but you got to choose. This day, whom you serve. Because for amazing things to be done amongst you, you must be consecrated. Everybody stand. How many people here want God to do amazing things in you and through you? Yeah. So this is for all of us. Can we let Starla sing for a second? And can we just lift our hands? If you want to walk around, I want you to give a moment to walk around. And let's just give ourselves to the Lord. Let's just worship Him. Let's give Him our lives. And just say, God, listen to me. If there's something that you know is wrong, and the Lord's been dealing with you about it, make it right before the sun goes down today. Make it right before the sun goes down today. If there's something in your life the Lord's convicting you of, has been convicting you of, but you have pushed it to the side, make it right before the end of the day. Do you hear me? Sing, Starlin. You guys can begin to pass out communion. I was a wretch, I remember. Just 